Valentin Flory. Uh, so Valentin actually started uh, his journey back in Switzerland in University of Bern. And uh, after graduating uh, from her, from master's studies from there, he moved to uh, FMI Institute in Basel, working with Professor Mark Buhler and uh, on the Noble Insights into Mechanisms Partitioning Chromatin Estates. And after graduating from FMI Institute, he moved to uh, Professor Anya Gross uh, lab in the uh, University of Copenhagen, uh, where, he studies, his, where he studies the H2A and H2B modifications. And I, I mean, he's currently doing his postdoc with several different actually uh, postdoc fellowships are uh, quite that's that's really quite spectacular. He has both uh, he has Embo long term fellowship and Marie Curie fellowship, and today we will hear from him about recycling of modified H two A H two B provides short term memory of chromatin states. And happy to have you, Valentin. Thanks a lot uh, for the kind introduction. <laughs> I'm really excited to uh, be part of this famous seminar series and I'm uh, excited to also show my postdoc work. Um, yeah, as you know, uh, we are very interested in, in chromatin, uh, all of us, and also in, in chromatin states. And uh, in our lab, we are uh, very interested in the nucleosome, the basic packaging unit of the DNA with all its beautiful modifications. Um, we are really interested in the memory aspect of how chromatin, chromatin states, histone modifications are, are maintained and whether they really have this epigenetic memory that we're talking about so often. And a prerequisite to have that epigenetic memory is really to be actually propagated during DNA, uh, during several different cellular processes. And our favorite process is DNA replication. Um, during DNA replication, DNA gets uh, doubled in content uh, with, uh, during, uh, with, with the highly uh, diverse uh, replication fork and very complicated process. But what's actually quite striking is that, just move the laser pointer here, chromatin and it's all very specialized chromatin states needs to get completely disrupted to allow the passage of the replication fork. After that, chromatin needs to be restored. And this is really a complex process and, and has to be faithfully reassembled to, to maintain chromatin states and therefore also ultimately cellular identity as the chromatin states is so important for regulating gene expression. Um, we and other, glue, other labs have been studying this process for uh, 20, 30 years now. Um, and it's been really a, a long journey and a lot of uh, efforts have been put in developing new technologies um, and to, to really go to the down to the mechanism how, how chromatin states are propagated. And I'm going to be mostly now exclusively focusing on histones, although we could also argue that maybe the 3D organization might be restored as well at some point. Uh, here we really deal with the basic packaging units. So already uh, 20, 20 years ago, it became clear that Histones are actually reused uh, with their modifications. So it's not that histones get de uh, demodified over during DNA replication. And this is also true for active and repressive marks. Um, furthermore, then new technologies also enabled us and other labs to say that this recycling of histone H3, H4 is accurate. And so they go more or less get redeposited on the same DNA sequence after replication fork passed through. Now we make two strands out of one. So the question is also where do these histones go? And we could show that these histones actually segregate symmetrically to both the other strands. Um, so this is also some kind of coordinated process that it's very exciting. And we are really like diving into the mechanisms here. Um, since the DNA content doubles, also uh, the, the histone content needs to double. So this uh, twofold increase in DNA is, is compensated by new histones that get deposited. Importantly, these new histones, they really lack most of the modifications that you find in parental or chromatinized histones. They are maybe acetylated at most, but they lack most of these other histone modifications, such as methylation, ubiquitination, etc. And then these naive histones, they get deacetylated, and then afterwards they get modified with the correct uh, histone mark 
depending on to which loci they have been recycled to. And these restoration kinetics, they are very different for the mark, for whether uh, we're looking at different marks. So active chromatin marks, such as K4 trimethylation, they restore very quickly after uh, replication and are restored prior to cell division, whereas the other, um, other repressive marks, they take very long. And they actually only get to the full steady state level shortly before the, the next DNA replication occurs. So this creates some sort of an imbalance, which is actually quite a bit puzzling when you think that in G2 after replication, you have full levels of active chromatin marks, whereas repressive chromatin marks are still on the rise. Now, um, as I mentioned, this recycling of, of uh, histone marks is actually really incorporated into the replication fork itself. So that's the components uh, that are responsible for copying the genetic information, such polymerase epsilon and polymerase alpha, they have at the same time also histone binding properties really linking these two processes, genetic and epigenetic inheritance together. So. Uh, we and the Shigo Sang's lab in Colombia, in New York, could pinpoint that several important players, such as MCM2, which helps to recycle parental histones to the lagging strand, as well with polalpha and CTF4, whereas polepsilon subunits E3 and E4 have histone binding properties for H3 and H4 that recycle it to the leading strand. So we know quite a bit about how uh, histone H3 and H4 are actually behaving during DNA replication. However, the picture about histone H2, H2B, the other half of the nucleosome is really sparse. And it actually, it started all together 50, 60 years ago by, by seminal uh, pioneering works of the Jackson and Chalkley labs that actually started looking at this two histones as well. And they could show that histone H2H2B to H to are actually reincorporated somewhere after replication. However, more than that was very difficult back then due to the not highest resolution technologies. And it has been really complicated also by the fact that histones H2 and H2B are actually, um, they not only get reincorporated during DNA replication, but they can also get reincorporated during transcription. And this really adds a lot of background and, and needs uh, asks for a technology that is sensitive and, and fast enough to actually look at histone H2 H2B right after replication. Furthermore, these, um, these uh, labs also found that uh, the nucleosome is disassembled to different extents. So the histone H3, H4 tetramer actually stays together during DNA replication, which tells you that basically for any given locus, the histone H3, H4 tetramer can either go to the leading or the lagging strand. Of course, chromatin states is more than just single nucleosome. So over several nucleosomes, thanks to the symmetry to recycle to both strands, this uh, symmetry of H3, H4 is still maintained. H2A, H2B, on the other hand, is recycled as a dimer, which gives you the exciting um, possibility that actually can form and communicate with both old H3, H4, parental H3, H4, and new H3, H4. Now, how do we discriminate whether it's new or old histones? I mentioned before that actually the histone marks really can help us to discriminate new and old. So old parental marks really have a set of, of histone modifications that do not exist in soluble de novo synthesized H2H2B. And looking at these marks, we can really dissect whether H2H2B are recycled and whether this maintains the positional information of H2H2B modifications and therefore can be memory. So these are the marks I looked at during my, my in, at the beginning of this project. H2A ubiquitination is a hallmark of, of repressed chromatin. It's really important for polycomp repression, and it's deposited by two enzymes, ring 1A, ring 1B. H2B ubiquitination is completely different to that. So it's actually not repressed, but actively transcribed chromatin and RNA polymerase 2 itself. Uh, recruits the enzymes RNF2040 to, to deposit that ubiquitin mark. And then finally, H2AC and the histone variant that is deposited outside of replication, so in a replication independent manner, and it's deposited at regulatory regions such as promoters and enhancers, and therefore also serves for us as a nice proxy. Now, using these marks, I applied now a new technology to it, which we developed here in the lab five years ago. And this technology is called ChorSeq. 
It's basically a chip seek approach, but with a specific purification step of nascent, freshly replicated chromatin. So what we do is we pulse our mouse embryonic stem cells um, with EDU. It's a thymidine analog, and it gets incorporated at sites of DNA synthesis, meaning at sites of DNA replication. We add a spike in of EDU labeled Drosophila. So with this, we can always stay quantitative. Also, when we then look at pulse chase approaches, you do then a chip of your chromatin mark of interest. That can also be a chromatin factor. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, a histone mark because uh, you can also do that in a cross-linked way. And that's what I've been doing. And then after the chip, you purify the, the nascent chromatin, the freshly um, freshly replicated chromatin by click, uh, clicking biotin to the EDU moiety and then to a very stringent strep davidin pull down. Then you amplify, you sequence, and you then watch and see how much, uh, what's the chromatin landscape looks like, what chromatin landscape looks like on nascent chromatin. That's what I did. Um, so you can see here for H2A ubiquitination that when I look at nascent chromatin, it really correlates very well with the total um, on, on pulse, the chromatin um, total chip seek uh, signal that we obtained from the same sample, both in terms of where the mark localizes, but also how intense this is. And here you see that the heat map comparing all the all the H2A UB peaks uh, between nascent and total. Um, Sorry, I forgot to say that these 10 minutes, they give us a really high temporal resolution because this is roughly 15 kilobases behind the fork. So we have not this problem of transcriptional exchange. And also in terms of spatial resolution, we have this chromatin size of around 300 base pairs because of that's the, the sonication that we, that, that we obtained. Now we see that's for H2AUB, but the same thing we actually also see for H2BUB. So it's not only repressive marks, but also active marks that are present on nascent chromatin. Marks nicely transcribe the genes in the genic region, as it's also in, in the total, uh, total chip seek. H2AC, same, same story. Um, also here we see nice uh, intensity, nice signal across uh, H2AC peaks called from total chip seek. Um, really highlighting that active and repressive H2H2B marks are present on nascent chromatin and they localize to the same sites. So we already thought, okay, that's that's recycling. However, we have to be careful here, and we really took another step to to get to rule out the the possibility that it's actually de novo um, deposition of this mark on the replicated chromatin. These enzymes are very active. They, they write the mark very quickly. So we really wanted to, to exclude that possibility that it's actually uh, the enzyme that comes on replicated chromatin. So to do that, we used the Degron approach where we obtained a, a really cool uh, cell line from Rob Close in Oxford where we can inducibly deplete ring 1AB um, uh, by addition of auxin. And we also prolonged the half-life of H2AUB a little bit by removing at the same time a ubiquitinase, the ubiquitinase BAP1. And you can see that, that after 80 minutes, ring 1B BAP1 is completely gone, whereas we still can keep uh, quite some considerate levels of H2AUB. So after this 70 minutes depletion, I then labeled the cells the last 10 minutes with EDU. And with this, we can now really rule out that the enzyme would deposit it de novo because it's not there anymore. And still we can pick up the signal on nascent chromatin to the same intensity as to the, to the total chip seek. So this really shows that h 2 AUB is, is recycled during replication. For h 2 bub ubiquitination, we took a different approach. We made use of the fact that replication and transcription is mutually exclusive. So RNA polymerase 2 has to bind to chromatin after the, RNA, uh, after the replication fork passed through. And we prevented that by adding triptolate to our EDU pulse, because with this, we can now really prevent the initiation of RNA polymerase to um, transcription after replication. And 10 minutes really already had an effect on global age to be ubiquitination level. So you can see here that across the TSS, so when in initiation is, is inhibited, we see a 70% reduction in the signal. However, when we look Globally, across all the gene bodies, we can still pick up H2B-UB signal on nascent chromatin, which also shows that H2B-UB quitination is recycled because there is no transcription restart um, after that uh, with this inhibition by triptolate. So this is 
really showcasing that H2A, H2B are recycled with their modifications. And as I mentioned, we have started diving into the, the mechanism how H3, H4 are recycled. So we ask the same question whether H2A, H2B are actually also recycled by the same mechanism. And if there is some kind of crosstalk or a kind of a correlation uh, of, of, H, of, of H3, H4 with H2A, H2B recycling. And to look at this, we used SCAR-seq, which is basically a similar method than CHOR-seq, but it involves a second um, purification step by, by now actually separating the strands where, where the biotin is attached to. And with this, you can then actually uh, map these, these reads to whether they came from the leading strand, which would be a reverse read, or the lagging strand, which would be a forward read. And of course, it's a bit more complicated than that, but the, the reverse and forward reads ratio basically give you a feeling for how symmetric, how abundant these marks are on both sister chromatids. So we can make an asymmetry plot, and this is here done for 27 trimethylation as our proxy. And you can see that in wild type cells, this asymmetry is close to zero, meaning that it's recycled symmetrically, whereas the Okazaki sequencing actually gives you the feeling for how much asymmetry you would have when you look specifically at lagging strand or leading strand. Now, when you mutate polepsilon or MCM2, H3K27 trimethylation becomes strongly asymmetric in the MCM2 mutant to the leading strand because you're disrupting lagging strand recycling in the poly4 knockout cells to the lagging strand because you're disrupting leading strand recycling. What about H2A UB? That's what we use for our proxy for parental H2H2B. You can see that here, H2A UB, first of all, in wild type cells is also recycled symmetrically. Please note that here the axis is slightly different in order to really give you the resolution needed. And it also doesn't react to when we mutate poly4 or MCM2. And this really shows that the recycling of H2A H2B is independent from H3, H4. But about polymerase alpha, it's a bit of a special factor because it actually was initially characterized as an H2A H2B binding protein by the Labib lab. And then later, Sigus Sang at Columbia showed that H3H4 is also bound by polymerase alpha. And indeed, we can pick this up when we mutate the histone binding domain of polymerase alpha and we get a strong leading strand bias. Now, intriguingly, we also see an increase in asymmetry for H2A ubiquitin. It's not as high, but it's reproducible, showcasing that, indicating that polymerase alpha is actually also involved in the recycling of H2A H2B and may serve as a general assembly fact, as an assembly platform after replication. After that, we went on and we actually asked how fast are these modifications restored and can we learn something from this? So to do that, we did a time course where we pulse for 10 minutes with EDU, then we remove this label. Uh, we wash the cells extensively to get the EDU out of, the, out of the, the cell in the medium. And then we look at how this restores over time. And since we have the Drosophila spiking, we can now actually do some kind of uh, uh, in, we can monitor the increase of that mark after replication and, and derive kinetics from it. And when you do that and you calculate the time where 90% of the signal is, is restored, you can see that the modifications on H2A and H2B are, are restored very quickly. And this is especially intriguing for H2A ubiquitination, which restores in less than two hours, so prior to cell division, whereas 27 trimethylation is restoring very slowly in agreement to the known mass, spect mass spectrometric data that we've obtained previously. So this really highlights that H2AUB is so far the only repressive modification that is restored prior to cell division and really points at the key function of H2AUB in, repressive chromo in repressing chromatin in G2. So now as the last uh, um, little data slide I wanna show you here, um, is we can now actually also start dissecting the crosstalk between the, the different histone modifications and especially post-replication. I've already introduced the MCM2 mutant before. In this mutant, we have asymmetric H3K27 trimethylation and symmetric recycling of H2A ubiquitination. Now, when we look at this asymmetry of H3K27 trimethylation over time, you can see that after three and eight hours, this asymmetry becomes closer to zero, which means that the abundance of 
K27 tri is now more, more similar, um, more symmetric, indicating that actually H3K27 tri methylation is also deposited on the lagging strand. And we ask now, is that because of H2A ubiquitination? Um, H2A ubiquitination and 27 trimethylation have a very um, extensive crosstalk to maintain these polycom domains. And to do that, we mutated MCM2 in this ring 1B Degron background, and then we depleted H2A UB completely prior to our EDU label, and then looked at H3K27 tri methylation asymmetry over time three and eight hours later. And when you do that, then you deplete the cells with auxin. Oh, sorry. Um, you can see that um, H2A ubiquitination, the depletion of H2A ubiquitination really completely holds. I cannot, uh, I have still the, the pictures of the panel here, so I cannot really show there. So just look on the right side of my cursor um, where you can really see that the restoration of asymmetries is stalled upon depletion of H2A UB, which pinpoints at the really important role of H2A ubiquitin to timely restore H3K27 trimethylation prior to, to uh, cell division and therefore to ensure timely transmission of chromatin states. And with this, I'm at the end um, of, of my presentation here. I just want to highlight the findings we had obtained in the last four years. Uh, I hope I convinced you today that parental H2H2B is recycled to, um, during DNA replication in a symmetric manner, independent from uh, H3H4 recycling, but involving a role of polymerase alpha. These marks are then restored very quickly post-replication, and they ensure that the, the, the slower restoring marks on H3H4 get restored accurately and faithfully at the right, at the right positions um, prior to cell division. And this is especially exciting because, as I mentioned before, H2H2B is recycled as a dimer, so it can actually go to both daughter strands. And we think that the intranucleosomal crosstalk of H2A, uh, H2H2B modifications incorp uh, incorporated on a new H3H4 are, are crucial to restore that. And it's the crosstalk between dynamic H2H2B modifications and slow H3H4 modifications that ensure faithful propagation of chromatin states. And with, the in, with this, I'm at the end of the talk and I would really like to acknowledge the entire lab, of course, Anya for her support, also NASA and Kathleen for ext extensive support in the, in the last uh, few months. Um, the funding, uh, Rob Klose, for uh, providing us with the cell line and, and through uh, advice throughout this project, the funding and uh, you for your attention. Thanks, Valentin, for this really amazing talk. So we already have uh, three questions in the Q&A. I will go first with James Gahan. Uh, James Gahan, as it looks from your scar sec that there is some bias for the leading strand for the H2A, H2B, is this the case? And if so, what do you think uh, affect this? So I, this is the, the asymmetry plot I showed was uh, actually on a slightly different scale. I do think that maybe the asymmetry is a slightly is slightly higher, and we have to be also aware that on the leading strand, probably the nucleosome assembly is slightly faster than on the lacking strand, which may may exacerbate the, the small difference we see. But I think it's 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 uh, it's maybe not it was not uh, represented the, the best way because the scale of the asymmetry for H two A UB was on a different level than for H three H four. So uh, there, okay. So there is this uh, second question is from Michael Hensel. Uh, Michael, is the H two A H two B ubiquitination not lost during M phase? How is the H three K twenty seven trimethylation influence post mitotic event? Yeah, it's a really good point, and that's why I think our our idea is that H two A H two B is is providing this short term memory because. Um, it's not been fully elucidated about ubiquitination marks on, on East on H2H2B, to H to but how they behave, behave during mitosis. Very old papers actually suggest that they may be removed. Um, therefore, we really think that the recycling of, of these marks during DNA replication, that's where they're um, 
it's, it's yeah more important to really help to restore chromatin whereas then after mitosis potentially the the more slow and more stable histone modifications they can then even feed back on on histones h2 h2b and i guess the same thing may also apply whenever you have transcriptionally based eviction of h2 h2b um where yeah again h3 h4 can feed back and that's how the crosstalk is basically mutual so the third question is from Matthew Levine. Uh, Matthias, hi, Valentin, nice tag. Do you see, synchronize your cells? I would tend to argue that 10 minutes of TPL treatment is not enough to prevent elongation, even in medium length genes. So I think you would need to assume that transcription is still on in some genes. Maybe you could also do EDUSEC uh, to control for this. Yeah, so we don't synchronize our cells. We, we look at them in an asynchronous manner. Um, we don't want elongating RNA polymerase 2 to be completely uh, off chromatin because with triptolid and with with uh, when you look at transcription after replication, you can you cannot have elongating RNA pol2 on because it will collide with uh, with the DNA polymerase. So um, this really is a mutual exclusive process. So we don't need to like remove all RNA pol2 from chromatin, but it's actually sufficient to just prevent the restart of transcription after DNA replication. So I will now uh, unmute Anirban because he raised his hand. So Anirban, go yeah. on. Uh, thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, great talk, Valentin. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about your opinion about uh, existence of histone monomer pools during histone exchange post uh, replication. Did you find uh, any evidence of uh, histone monomer pools? So we only look at chromatinized. So we do a chip, right? We only look at chromatinized H to H to B. Um, I guess the monomer pools, whether they're existing um, during DNA replication, we cannot we cannot really do with our with our methods because it's cross linking and um, uh, I, there are like there are mentions that like the newly synthesized histones they may get imported as as a monomer by by the Bowman lab, yeah. And did so, you find? Oh, uh, no, go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, did you find any evidence of uh, NASP in uh, in conducting this uh, histone recycling that you talked about? Yeah, so NASP is a, is a histone chaperone that is, um, it's also, it's mainly reported to bind the newly synthesized histone prior to, right. to that position, right? Uh, we didn't look at uh, any symmetry of, of potentially like we could also look at symmetry of newly deposited histones because we can also we have few antibodies that actually are specific for new new histones and not parental histones. We did, but we didn't look at all at uh, any asymmetries or or Chorsig or or so for in NAS mutants. No, we didn't do that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, anyone, for the question. And the last question is, okay, there's two questions. So one of the questions from Tasnim uh, Fetian. Uh, Tasnim asks, hi, Valentin, nice. Like, do you know what regions of the genome the recycled H2B ubiquitin, even after triptolite treatment, are enriched at? In genic, in genic regions, on gene bodies, yeah. So the signal you see is, is on gene bodies. Yeah. And uh, Jacques Cote, the final question is from Jacques Cote. Jacques Cote asks, uh, so what about H2AZ versus transcription? So we also see H2AC on recycled, uh, on nascent chromatin in the presence of triptolate. Yes. Mm -hmm. We didn't like follow okay. it up very thoroughly uh, because we thought H2AC is not only it is also marking like actively transcribed promoters or promoters of active genes, but mm -hmm. since it's also deposited in in uh, in repressed promoters, um, we thought that transcription may not have a, a prevalent role. What we do see though is that the restoration of H2AC is faster when you have transcriptionally active genes. So these promoters they gain full steady state levels of H2AC faster than than promoters marked by 27 trimethylation, for example. Thanks, Valentin, and for the amazing talk and also amazing discussion.